May Lord's name be glorified. What a great privilege it is for us to once again be together in the presence of our God and to sit before his word. Uh, first off, for the children, this is the last opportunity to get your sermon notes written down. Uh, and unlike uh, Vijay Uncle, I'm not that generous. Uh, so you'll have to listen. Um, the points will come up on screen if you want to uh, write them down. So as we are going through the series, you know, looking at the gospel through the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, this is the final sermon in that series. You know, last week we talked about the Song of Moses, where Moses was talking about uh, how do we receive and respond to the word of God. But today we are going back in the book of Deuteronomy to this chapter. So if you remember, uh, the Song of Moses was further along in the book of Deuteronomy. And this chapter talks about the right ways that God's message will be given to the children of Israel, and specifically about who will deliver God's word. And those are the prophets. That's why you see these warnings about uh, false prophets and false ways of trying to acquire information that seems to be from God. So why are we going backwards in the book of Deuteronomy? First off, you know, it's interesting that this is the only passage in the first five books that talks of prophecy as an institution of God. So whenever we read, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what captures our attention is, is obviously the fact that the priesthood is instituted by God. But this is the only passage that also talks about prophecy as an institution of the Lord. So if you look at verse 15, it says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. So it is the Lord's work to raise up prophets and thereby to bring about the transmission and recording of his word. But that's not the main reason why we are going back. The main reason we are going back is it is there is an interesting contrast. As we think about how do we see the gospel in the first five books of the Bible? How do we see the gospel in the whole of the Old Testament? You see here an interesting contrast between the institution of prophecy in this passage. You know what's, again, uh, I have to find other words for the word interesting, but bear with me. What's also interesting about this passage is that this in itself is a prophecy. Even though it talks about prophecy, it is a prophetic passage about prophecy. And what we see here is a contrast between what it says on the surface and what actually happens in the Old Testament. So this passage prepares Israel to expect a prophet like Moses to come after Moses. So in the immediate context, it talks about Joshua. And then later on, it, you know, we read about Samuel and we read about Isaiah and Jeremiah and so on. So it prepares the children of Israel to expect a prophet like Moses who will come after Moses so that they are not left adrift from hearing God's word after Moses passes away. But then you come to the end of Deuteronomy and what, is, and what does it say? Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 10 says that, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So do you see the contrast? So this last verse in Deuteronomy is like a capstone for Moses' ministry. You know, if, if they had ever found Moses' body and, 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 and created a grave with a tombstone, they might have written something like this. There has not arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses. But this is what God's word says is true for the entirety of the prophetic line in Israel. That is, they would not be a prophet like Moses. So the contrast is between expecting a prophet like Moses and the declaration here is that there isn't a prophet like Moses. But as we know, this is not the capstone for the word of God. There will indeed be a prophet like Moses. In fact, that prophet will be greater than Moses. This passage prepares its listeners to expect a prophet who is greater than Moses himself. And for that to happen, 
it would not only take God to institute the ministry of prophecy, but for God himself to come down and become a prophet. And that is what we read in John chapter 1 and verse 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The very word of God comes down to declare the word of God. And so when we come to the book of Acts, Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verse 17 onwards, um, and we'll quickly read verse uh, 19 and onwards. It says, Repent therefore and turn back so that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. And then the fulfillment of Moses' prophecy, verse 22. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. So ultimately, the prophecy of Moses is fulfilled, not in any of the prophets that came after him, but in one specific prophet. That is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we end our look at the gospel in the Torah by seeing how Moses himself prophesies the arrival of a prophet greater than himself. And then this passage gives us some pointers on what true prophecy or what truly is the word of God is and also what it is not. And we may also take some lessons for how we are to approach God's word in this era after which, you know, after the arrival of Christ. How are we as Christians to respond to the word of God? So the first thing we notice in this passage is that sinful human beings need an intermediary to come to God. Sinful human beings need an intermediary. You know, the first half of this passage that we did not read talks about uh, the provision of priests and Levites. So verse, eight, verse 5 of chapter 18 says, the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons for all time. So this is talking about the priesthood. The priesthood is to come from the tribe of Levi. So the priests represented men and women before God. They were intermediaries. We're reminded that God used to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. But because of sin, now human beings could not enter into the presence of a holy God. So the priesthood was established to bring about temporary atonement on behalf of sinful men and women. Therefore, a continuing line of priests was established by God himself. But along with God's presence, there is also God's word. In fact, the Bible begins with the word of God. It says, in the beginning, God said. So God's word that is spoken and written down. You know, at this point in time in Israel's history, they only have one part of God's word that is written down. What part is that? The Ten Commandments, right? That's, that's all they have. But what, what this prophecy tells us is that God's word that is spoken and then written down like the Ten Commandments were also needed for a relationship with God. It was not just important for people to be represented uh, to God, but it was also important for God to be represented to people. That is through the word of God. And only those who obeyed God's word could enter into, a, into the presence of God could enter into a relationship with God. Now, the children of Israel had a frightening experience of hearing God speak, and that's what this passage refers to in, at, at Mount Horeb. And there they recognized that the word of God is inseparable from the holy presence of God. To hear the word of God was as if you were encountering God himself. So the children of Israel appealed to Moses that we do not want to hear from God directly because to do so is almost as if we are entering the most holy place. And we as sinful people do not have the confidence to enter into the presence of God. So Moses says in verse 16 of this chapter that just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. So an intermediary was created. That is the prophet. 
of whom Moses was the first. The word of God is inseparable from the presence of God. And that's why we see the requirements for obedience. In verse 18, it says, I will raise up for them a prophet, and then you see at the end, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That is, the prophet spoke the very words of God. Just because it wasn't God's voice, you know, I, I, we have no idea how God's voice sounded to the children of Israel. The closest we have is, you know, everyone listening to, uh, I don't know who spoke the voice of God in the Ten Commandments, but they processed it through a lot of like echo and, and boominess filters and so on. But we don't know, but it was fearful. But what we read here is that the prophet spoke as if God himself was speaking. Therefore, the obligations for obedience were the same. Verse 19, and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself, that is God himself, will require it. There is no difference between listening to God's word spoken directly by God, spoken through a prophet, or spoken through God's word that is granted to us or given to us as scripture. To disobey the word of God was, to, was the same as disobeying God's direct speech. And so Moses lays the obligation upon the children of Israel that they were to listen to the word of God that was recorded through the prophets. But then you see here that before we come to the requirements for who is a true prophet, the passage also gives us some context for this prophecy. And it's talking about a rebellion that is going on since the beginning of time after the fall against the word of God. There's a rebellion against God's word. If you come to verse 9, it says, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. So this is before they come into the promised land. Last week we looked at the Song of Moses, and that was the same context. Before they entered into the promised land, Moses gave them some ground rules. When Moses is dead, they were not to seek insight or foresight. You know, th both of those things are valid in prophecy, right? Insight, what is happening to me? Foresight, what is going to happen? They were not to seek either of those things through the demonic activities of the pagan nations that they were, whose land they were coming to inhabit. And that would be the temptation. Practices such as divination and fortune telling and sorcery and necromancy you know, necromancy, I, 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 you know, I don't think many people know what necromancy is. When I was a kid, I used to play video games, and that would have necromancers, so people who would raise up uh, the dead uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, make them alive kind of thing. But necromancy here is, uh, is talking about practices where they would inquire of dead people about prophecy. They would inquire what is going to happen or what is happening by raising up the spirits of those who are dead. And why is necromancy so abhorrent to God? Because it is only those who do not have a living God that would seek knowledge from the dead. If you don't have a living God, then you are going to go and seek knowledge from those who are dead. And so when that temptation arose, they were to remember what Moses said. Moses says in verse 12, that whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And in fact, it is because of these abominations that the Lord your God is driving out those nations from the land that you're going to inhabit. The reason they were entering into the promised land, defeating their enemies, was because of the rebellion of these people against the holy God of the universe and specifically against his word. But instead of being like those people, they were to be, in verse 13, they were to be blameless before the Lord your God. It literally reads, they were to be perfect before the Lord your God. That is, what was the perfection that was required of them? They were not to listen to, like the nations, verse 14, they were not to listen to fortune tellers, to diviners, because the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. It was incompatible with the holiness of God to be seeking after these practices. It was not just enough to obey the word that God had given, but it was also 
they were not to rebel against God by seeking foresight and insight and intermediation through unlawful and rebellious means. Now you might think that this is because somehow God feared competition. You know, I want to be the sole source of prophecy. I, I, I know I don't, I don't want to be in competition with all these other pagan prophets and demons and so on. But that is not the case. We know in the case of Balaam, Balaam and Balak, God overpowered the divination of Balaam to bless Israel when he was trying to curse them. And instead the curses fell on, on Balak and his people. So it's not about the fact that God cannot overturn false prophets or false prophecy. But it is something else. It is because seeking after God's word through illegal means or seeking a, a word that is apart from the word of God is equal to seeking another God. If the word of God cannot be separated from his presence, seeking after another word is tantamount to seeking after another God. It is not just disobedience, but it is rebellion. You know, when, when Saul goes against the word of God in the book of 1 Samuel. You know, this is what Samuel says to him, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 to 23. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. You know, but you know this verse. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. Next words, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. It is not just seeking after false prophets that puts you in conflict with God, but the very act of rebelling against God, the very act of presuming that God has said something that he has not said is tantamount to the sins that the pagan nations were judged for, that is divination and iniquity and idolatry. So God is telling them, because you are rebelling against me, because you will have the heart of rebellion, you will seek divination. It is not the other way around. It is not that holy people are somehow tempted by false prophets and taken in. It, it goes the other way. It is because the root of rebellion is already in your heart that you will seek after anything other than the word of God. It is because I think that God and his word is not sufficient that I am not satisfied, that is the starting point for me to go after false teaching. Isaiah, you know, the prophet Isaiah says this in chapter 30, verse 9 to 11, for they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, that's the prophets, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right, instead do what? Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. What is false teaching? What is false prophecy? The appeal of false teaching and false prophecy is that they tell you exactly what you want to hear. It is not because they are telling you something that is so uh, disruptive or so mind-altering. It is because they tell you exactly what you want to hear that you will seek after false teaching and false prophecy. That is the root of seeking after false prophets. The rebellion and the inclination to hear what we want to hear, not what God wants to say. It's like, you know, when, when children, as parents, you know, we, we try to give children healthy breakfast. If children were to ask the question, what is a healthy breakfast? And if we said, oh, you know, I don't know. Um, cereal and, and, and maple syrup all the time, they would be very happy. They would seek after parents like that. But we know like that's not true. So we try to bring them along on the correct way. Similarly, in today's world, how do you get a big audience in churches? How do you get a big audience for any religious gathering? By telling people what they want to hear. 
that success in this world is greater is, is something that you need to seek after with all your with all your heart that you can lay aside the things of God and instead honor him by just being fully engaged in the things of this world you know you go to so many gatherings and the word of God is not preached instead what is there is is proclaimed as the word of God there are things that are just soothing that are that are just things that appeal to our hearts because they speak to us in some basic way. You know, if I came here and said, you know, I sense that there are many sisters here who haven't slept well last night and are burdened with the worries of how their children will grow up, I have a word for you to say from the Lord that the Lord has you in his heart, many people will come. If people were to say, I know that you are suffering from migraines and you have, you know, I've, I've gone to meetings like this where there's like literally 5,000, 10,000 people and someone will stand up on stage and, and I see that there's a sister who's having a migraine, you know, the odds of that. And then they'll say, oh, I have the word from the Lord that he is about to heal you. People will come for that. You know, we were reading the passage from 2 Corinthians where Paul's, uh, God says, you know, the thorn in the flesh was granted to you so that my grace would be made, uh, that you would, you would, you know, my grace would be shown through your weakness. If we preach that today, even the people who are here will probably leave. But that's what the root of false prophecy is. The idea that people want to hear what they want to hear. And for, there's always going to be, you know, uh, our brother Phil was talking about, uh, business administration, right? The foundation of business in a free market society is the is demand. Where there is demand, something will always come up in order to satisfy that demand. And what is the demand for false prophecy? It is a rebellion in the hearts of people. When that demand dies, false prophecy will cease to exist. But as long as we're in this fallen world before the coming of Christ, it will never die. So it's rebellion against the word of God that lays the foundation for false prophecy. So then you come to the question of who will then be the prophet of God? What are the attributes of the prophetic line? Verse 15 says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen. First, that he will be like Moses in terms of his trustworthiness and his role as the trusted messenger of God. He will be an Israelite he will come from among the people. And the difference would be, though, that with Moses, he was attested by God himself with signs and wonders. He was visibly called out and separated from the people on, the Mount, uh, on, 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 on Mount Sinai, as an example. But how would Israel know that the future prophets would indeed be trustworthy like Moses? revealing only what God commanded him to, him to say. Now, one thing God says is in verse 20, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet should, shall die. So many folks will come and claim to be prophets, but not all of them would be commissioned by God. They were operating either out of delusion or presumption. And the conditions included speaking in the name of foreign gods or speaking in the name of God, of Yahweh, but speaking uh, false claims. I don't want, I, we don't have too much time to spend uh, going through this passage, but you see here in verse 21 and 22, there is a problem. This passage itself lays forth the problem without giving any clear solutions. If you say in your heart, how may we, uh, verse 21, 22, how may we know that the word that the Lord has not spoken it says, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. The problem with this, what is the problem with this? In the moment, you do not know, right? You have to wait. If I'm, a, you know, like I'm Geo Phillips, a famous prophet, I come here and tell you in five years, God has uh, deemed that you will be a multimillionaire. You have to wait five years, right? And then when five years comes, you know, I might weasel out 
you know, the history of prophecy is lined up with people who make bold claims and then weasel out, saying that this thing happened or that thing happened. That is why you are not rich. If you, talk, if you look at the word faith movement, they say that you will become rich. When you do not become rich, what do they say? Oh, it's because you lack faith. Right? But there's also the other problem, like what happened to the prophet Jonah? He spoke the word of God. He proclaimed judgment against the children of Nineveh. Well, what happened? The judgment did not come. Instead, repentance came about. And so, how do you distinguish between the cases where it was true prophecy that led to the intended outcome and thereby the prophecy did not come to its full extent or just false prophecy? Again, we go back to the root of the problem. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, that is indeed it comes true, and then he says, if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, verse 3, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God wants to know, do you want foresight? Do you want insight? Is that your primary purpose in life? Or do you want to love God and serve him? Because there would be cases where a false prophet would say something and they would come true. And then he would say, hey, by the way, let's abandon following Yahweh and go after some other God. What would you do? That is the test that God has uh, put in place for the children of Israel. Because true prophecy, again, reflected the inclination of the people and the disposition of their heart to God. It was not based on ultimately whether things came true or things didn't come true or so on. If you loved God with your heart and with your soul, that, was, that ground was fertile for the word of God. If you did not love God, then you had, that ground was fertile for false prophecy. And so the history of prophets in Israel after Moses was one of false prophets, but also true prophets who could not change the heart of the people. The history of Israel is not of a nation led astray by false prophecy. It is of a nation led astray by the rebellion of their own heart. And therefore, there would be no prophets like Moses who could make an impact like Moses. They were all like Moses in ethnicity, but not in the impact that they brought among God's people. So then we come to the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. Who is this prophet who would be greater than Moses? You know, God himself says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, you know, he says to Miriam, the sister of Moses, he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make him myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, but not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. So regardless of any other prophets that would come out of Israel, God himself says Moses would be above them. So if the prophecy of Moses has to come true, there has to be someone who will be greater than Moses. There has to be someone whose intimacy with God is greater than the intimacy that Moses shared with God. Where God spoke to Moses as if he spoke with him face to face. There has to be someone who is able to overcome the rebellious disposition of the heart of God's people. And so that was the expectation of the Jewish people. That one day a prophet greater than Moses would come. And through the times of Isaiah and through the times of Jeremiah and the exile and all the prophets who come after the exile and then 400 years of silence where God's word was not proclaimed at all in the history of Israel they held on to this prophecy that one day a prophet greater than Moses himself would come down. And it is this prophecy that is fulfilled through the advent of Jesus Christ. As we read, he's the word become flesh. Who has greater intimacy with God than God himself? Who has greater ability to change the hearts of people than the one who can send, uh, send out his Holy Spirit 
into the hearts of those people. You know, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son. He is the ultimate expression of God's prophetic word because he is God's word. He is the word of God. He does not say, thus saith the Lord. He says, truly I say. The authority of his word doesn't have to be evaluated because it is rooted in his very person. Because he is God, everything he says is true. You know, he says, you know, Jesus says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You know, Moses inaugurated the old covenant with the word that was given to him on Mount Sinai. But this prophet, the greater prophet, he inaugurates the new covenant. As you read in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law or put my word within them and I will write it on their very hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. His word given to us and applied to our hearts by his spirit, that is the only thing that makes it possible for us to remove from us a spirit of rebellion. And instead it enables us to live in freedom to obey the word of God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. That is the passage we read from Numbers. To testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Verse 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house as his son. And if we are his house, we will hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So what is our response to the word of God? Now, this is why Peter says in Acts that the time has now come where the greater prophet prophesied by Moses has arrived. What is our obligation? It says in verse uh, 22 and 23 of Acts chapter 3, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to this prophet shall be destroyed from the people. His word is the means to eternal life. So no other prophet, no other word is needed. If your goal in life, and I, you know, it's not if your goal, our goal in life should be to have relationship, should be to have an eternal relationship with God. And if the word of God in Christ is the means by which we shall obtain that, no other word is needed. That speaks to the sufficiency of the word of God. But if you disobey his word, then no other prophet can make up for your lack of eternal security. You cannot supplement your disobedience by just going after other prophets. So obedience should be our first response. Secondly, we should recognize its sufficiency. If it is, um, if it is able to, to make us enter into an eternal, unseparable relationship with God, that means it truly is sufficient for all purposes pertaining to our life in this world and the world to come. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. When we talk about the sufficiency of God's word, we're not talking about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't teach me how to, uh, you know, uh, do a balance sheet. You have to go to MAS to learn business administration maybe to do that. It's not talking about that. It's saying that the sufficiency of God's word is enough for us to progress in life towards the goal with which God has placed us in this world. So we should recognize the sufficiency of God's word. Where God's word says we are to do something, we have to do it. Where God's word says you should not do something, you should not do it. And then there are things where maybe it's not so clear, you can seek the insight through the study of God's word and through the community of his people. So we recognize our obligation to obey and we recognize its sufficiency, but we should also recognize its vitality. Hebrews chapter four and verse 12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is not some book of history that was recorded 
a thousand years ago and you know like we read uh, Homer's Odyssey or something like that it says the word of God is living and active you know in Hebrews chapter 4 it's talking about the Psalms and it's saying that the Psalm when we read the Psalms it's as if that Psalm was just written today and all of the things that it says is still true today that's what it means by living and active. To say that the word of Christ is not sufficient to answer the questions of life is to question not only the sufficiency of his word, but also the vitality of the word of God. You know, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and 16, you know, talking about the epistles of Paul, he says, as he does in all letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. No one is saying that the study of God's word is going to be easy, but we must labor in it because it is the word of God. We understand that it will be difficult, but God has placed us in communities. He has given us resources so that we can labor in it faithfully, and those who seek to apply the word of God faithfully in their lives, God will never let them down. And lastly, we understand that as we await our final redemption, there is still our, uh, you know, we are still prone to rebellion. You know, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their what? Their own passions. You will seek after the teacher based on the inclination of your heart. It's not the other way around. No false teacher can mislead you unless you are so actively seeking to be misled. And it says we will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Many false prophets today, they feed on the f lies of our hearts that seek to deceive us. There are people who are ready to say what we want to hear. There are people who will excuse a lot of things that's going on in society and couch it under the language of love or, 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 or grace or mercy. But the reason they succeed is not because of anything inherently uh, good in what they say. It's because that's what the people who are listening to them, that's what they want to hear. But we have to recognize the privilege that we have. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 says, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. There's never been a time in history where this is true more than today. Literally, the word of God is near us. We all have our scriptures, uh, you know, in the form of hardcover Bibles, paperback, large print, small print, uh, tablet apps, phone apps, uh, home assistance, whatever. Don't take it for granted. Don't throw it to the side. Don't chase after the answers we want to hear to please ourselves and please those in the world. Instead, we are maybe be those who labor and do not tire of the perfection of God's word. Let me end by reading Psalm 119, verse 14 to 16. It says, in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways, and I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for the privilege we have uh, to be in the presence of your word, which we recognize a lot is tantamount. It's the same as being in your very presence. As the book of Hebrews reminds us, we are people who can enter into the presence of a holy God through the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary, whose sacrifice we came here to remember this Sunday morning. And because of that, we are free to enter into your presence and call you our Father. But we also recognize that today we have the word of God because the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And he has given to us his words in scripture. Maybe not be like the people of Israel whose hearts uh, deceived them in seeking after a deception that they wanted to pursue. They made the land fertile for false prophets and false prophets. Instead, maybe be those who labor in the word, who recognize that even though there are things that are difficult for us to understand, even though there are things in there that make our own lives difficult to
to live in a society that rebels against your name. May we be those who are courageous and confident and strong to stand up for your word in our families, in our churches, in our societies, in our workplaces, in our schools, because we recognize the Lord. There's nothing more precious that is granted to us today in this world than the sufficiency of God's word. May we rely on those, may we be strengthened by that, and may we be those who, as God's people, uh, seek after your mandate to pursue its riches day after day, week after week. We pray that will be true of us in the weeks to come and as we await the coming of your Son, uh, in whose name we ask all these things. Amen.